Today's video was made possible by Atlas VPN. Get powerful protection for your internet surfing by using the link in the description and in the pinned comment to get a three year plan of Atlas VPN premium for just $1.83 a month, plus an extra three months free, all with a 30 day money back guarantee. Today we're gonna to look at a very interesting function. And that function has a piecewise definition, but even though it has a piecewise definition, we'll see that it is very nicely behaved. So this function is defined as e to the minus one over x for positive values of x, and as zero for values of x that are non-positive. In other words, when x is less than or equal to zero. So here's just a little sketch of this graph. So notice that the function is coincident with the x-axis up until the origin, and then it will eventually become asymptotic to the line y equals one. And the really important thing to note here is that it's not asymptotic to the x-axis in the negative direction, it's actually equal to the x-axis in the negative x direction. Okay, so what's so interesting about this function? Well, as we'll see, it'll highlight one of the main differences between differentiability in the real numbers and differentiability in the complex numbers. Okay, so let's first show that this thing is continuous. And notice we only really need to show that it's continuous at one point, and that's at the origin when x is equal to zero. That's because it's made up of two functions which are clearly continuous away from zero. Okay. So in order to show it's continuous, we need to look at the limit as x goes to zero from the right of f of x, and hopefully that will be equal to zero, which is the value of the function at zero, but also the limit as x goes to zero from the left of f of x. But that's pretty clear because we have a constant function over here. Okay, so if we are above zero, then f of x takes on this top form. So we have the limit as x goes to zero from above of e to the minus one over x. Okay, but notice we can do a change of variables here, and maybe it's not super necessary in this case, but it will be helpful in like a forthcoming setup. Let's change t equals one over x. But notice if x is going to zero from above, then t is going to positive infinity. So this turns into the limit as t approaches positive infinity of e to the minus t, but that's exponential decay, so that clearly gives us zero. But like I said, that's equal to two things. That's equal to f of zero, and it's equal to the limit as x goes to zero from below of f of x. So the fact that this limit here, this right-handed limit, the value of the function and the left-handed limit are all coincidental tells us that this function is continuous. Well, in fact, it really just tells us that this function is continuous at zero, but by our previous discussion, it's kind of obviously continuous everywhere else. Okay, well, we drew it as being continuous, so this is not a super big surprise. Let's look at what its derivative is near zero. Now let's look at the first derivative of this function. But notice the first derivative will take on two different forms depending on which region we're in. We just hope that they match up around this crossover point, which is zero. So here, our first derivative will look something like this. So using the chain rule over here, we'll get one over x squared times e to the minus one over x when x is bigger than zero. And then the derivative of zero is zero when x is less than zero. And then we lose what's going on at x equals zero when we take the derivative. But we can maybe obviously define the value of the derivative at zero if indeed these like match at zero. But that will involve taking a limit of this as we approach zero from above again. So let's look at that. So like I said, we're gonna look at the limit as x goes to zero from above of f prime of x, which will be one over x squared times e to the minus one over x. 
So let's do that same substitution, that t substitution, and that'll leave us with the limit as t goes to infinity of t squared times e to the minus t, which is equal to the limit as t goes to infinity of t squared over e to the t. And now we can apply L'Hopital's rule twice if we wanted to, and that'll give us the limit as t goes to infinity of two over e to the t. Again, by taking L'Hopital's rule twice, the second derivative of the numerator and the second derivative of the denominator, keeping in mind that we in fact have an indeterminate form, so we're allowed to do that, but that's gonna give us zero. And this should be the limit as t goes to infinity. Okay. But that means that this like right-handed and left-handed derivative around x equals zero just gives us a value of zero. So I think it's pretty clear that because of that, the obvious value for our derivative of f at zero will be zero. So in other words, we have f prime of zero is zero. Now I'd like to talk to you about the sponsor of today's video, Atlas VPN. First off, they are the most affordable choice. A three-year plan is only $1.83 a month, and you get three months for free. I think that's a crazy good deal. So often when I'm traveling at conferences or giving math talks, I often like to unwind at the end of the night by watching my favorite streaming service. But sometimes if I'm out of the country, the same titles are not available. You can set your IP address to be any country. So when I'm traveling, maybe I'll set it back to the US to watch my favorite shows that I've been watching at home. Or maybe when I'm at home, I'll set it to somewhere in Europe or Australia and unlock some content that is not available in the United States. So next up, Atlas VPN allows you to protect unlimited devices because I not only have a laptop, but you know I also want it on my phone and on my tablet. And the ability to protect all of my devices with one account and actually all of the devices of my family members too is just super convenient. So my next reason is one that not everyone talks about all the time, the ability to save money while shopping online. So sometimes when I'm searching for plane tickets, I've noticed that if you change your IP address to a different country, you could end up with cheaper flights. Next up, you can stop malware and be protected from the sneaky little trackers that are inside internet ads. Finally, one of the most important points is to keep your internet traffic private. You might think that when you open that incognito tab that no one can tell what's going on, but your ISP is still tracking you. And maybe the best and easiest way to keep that from happening is with a VPN. And you know, like we've been talking about this whole time, I think Atlas VPN for all of these reasons and more is really your best choice on the market right now. Their apps work on all major platforms and operating systems and offer hassle-free, lightning fast premium VPN protection. Get this incredible limited time deal now because you can get Atlas VPN premium for only $1.83 a month plus three months extra. And just in case you also get a 30 day money back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get many benefits of Atlas VPN at this ridiculously low price. You can take this deal by clicking on the link in the description or in the pinned comment below. And once again, I'd like to thank Atlas VPN for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so now that we've got that together with what we saw previously, which was f of zero equals zero, and the continuity, let's maybe explore the higher derivatives. So we just got done arguing for our function over here defined as follows, that it was equal to zero at zero, also continuous, and its derivative was equal to zero at zero, and furthermore, the derivative function was also continuous. Now we're gonna prove a somewhat bigger claim, and that is for x larger than zero, the nth derivative of f is equal to p of n evaluated at one over x times e to the minus one over x, where p of n is some sort of polynomial of degree two n. Okay, so let's maybe see how this goes. So let's prove this maybe by induction. So notice our base case is essentially done. Notice the n equals zero case is the zeroth derivative, which is just e to the minus one over x. But that means we're multiplying by a constant, but multiplying by a constant is a polynomial of degree two times zero, which is zero. 
And then let's look at the n equals one case, which we already explored. We had f prime of x is one over x squared e to the minus one over x. Again, that's a polynomial of degree two times one. And now what we'll do is find a recursion on these polynomials p sub n. So let's notice that p sub n plus one of one over x times e to the minus one over x, that's equal to the n plus first derivative of f. But the n plus first derivative is the derivative of the nth derivative. But the derivative of the nth derivative is the derivative of p sub n one over x e to the minus one over x. But now we can evaluate that using the product rule and the chain rule. So let's see, that's gonna give us something like minus one over x squared times p sub n prime of one over x times e to the minus one over x. That's like taking the derivative of the polynomial part. And then after that, we'll have plus one over x squared times p sub n of one over x e to the minus one over x. That's from taking the derivative of the exponential part. But now doing our change of variables will allow us to like compute these polynomials fairly quickly. So notice that p sub n plus one of t is in fact equal to t squared times, let's see, we have p sub n of t minus p sub n prime of t. Great. And like I said, we can calculate some of the values of this fairly easily. So let's say we have n and then p sub n t here, and let's write out a couple of them. So let's maybe skip down to two because we already know zero and one from this setup up here. So for two, we'll have t squared times t squared minus two t. Okay. And then for n equals three, we'll have t squared, and then we'll have this function minus its derivative. Where, well, where we've multiplied all of that out. So that'll end up giving us something like t to the fourth plus two t cubed plus six t squared. So that's what we get for the n equals three case. And then I'll let you check the rest of them, but notice this is a nice and efficient way of calculating all of those polynomials. Okay, so now that we have motivated the fact that we have this kind of closed form of our derivative, let's now show that that leads to every derivative of f evaluated at zero, giving us zero. Okay, on the last board we got a format for our derivative at positive values of x, but notice the derivative at negative values of x is just equal to zero based on this piecewise definition over here. But what we'd really like to do is argue that the derivative at zero is equal to zero. And we can do that by showing that these match at zero by taking the limit from above of this object. So let's do that. So let's take the limit as x goes to zero from above of the nth derivative of f at x. So that's gonna be the limit as x goes to zero from above of our polynomial p sub n evaluated at one over x e to the minus one over x. But now we're gonna do that same substitution that we did previously, that x equals one over t or t equals one over x, that changes it to a limit as t goes to infinity of p sub n of t over e to the t. But now we can repeatedly use L'Hopital's rule or just use the fact that exponential functions will always dominate polynomial functions to argue that this is equal to zero. But that will link these two values of our derivative, which tells us that yes, indeed, the derivative being equal to zero is a reasonable expectation for this function. So let's look at this function again. To the right of the x-axis or to the right of the y-axis, it's doing whatever. To the left of the y-axis, it's always equal to zero, but it's like becoming super flat at the origin. In fact, every derivative of this function is equal to zero at the origin.
Let's see how that applies to its power series expansion. So we just showed for all n bigger than or equal to zero, the nth derivative of f evaluated at zero was zero. Okay, but now let's do a Taylor expansion based at zero. So that's sometimes called a Maclaurin expansion. So Taylor expansion at, like I said, x equals zero. So let's recall that that will have the following formula. So we'll have the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of the nth derivative of f evaluated at zero over n factorial times x to the n. But notice since all of those are equal to zero, this will just be a bunch of zeros added to each other. So this gives us zero. Now I'm not gonna say this is f of x, but this is maybe twiddle f of x. So in other words, f of x is kind of like this near x equals zero. But now let's talk about the radius of convergence. And I claim that the radius of convergence, which I'll call capital R, is equal to zero. And why is that? That's because if x is anything larger than zero, even if it's like just a tiny bit bigger than zero, then f of x is not equal to zero. That's because we're plugging something into an exponential function, which is like a real number. We're plugging a real number into an exponential function, but exponential functions are never zero. In fact, they're always bigger than zero, so we can say f of x is strictly bigger than zero. But on the other hand, we have the Taylor series evaluated at this x to the n is equal to zero. So we have the function is not equal to the series for all x bigger than zero, including super small x. So that means the power series, even though it always converges, it does not converge to the function if we are to the right of the y-axis. So that actually makes this function an example of something which is smooth, which means it's infinitely differentiable, but it is not analytic. Analytic means that it can be expanded as a power series at every point, but this cannot be expanded as a power series at zero. Now I'd like to point out this following fact. In the complex numbers, smooth is the same thing as analytic. But in the real numbers, as we've just seen, smooth is not the same thing as analytic. So what's actually gone on like at a more deep level here is that we've uncovered a function that's very well behaved in the real numbers in that it's smooth, but it cannot be smooth in the complex numbers. In fact, it's not even differentiable in the complex numbers. So it's actually not very well behaved in the complex numbers. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.